It's Thursday afternoon in Winston-Salem. Just watch out for the mop bucket. Go this one. I'm about to embed for 12 hours overnight with Forsyth County EMS, tracking overdoses. We're more than just ambulance drivers. I think that's the one thing that irritates our profession more than anything, is we get called ambulance drivers, and we're not just ambulance drivers. We can handle anything from bringing life in or being there when someone is dying. There's been times where the call for us to come out was too late for us to even do anything and the patient has already succumbed to the overdose. The heroin in the last, what, about two years, I would say, has went up drastically. Some of the people I've talked to said that you can't describe it, they, they call it the heroin hug. And they said, you know, the first time you do it, you just get this secure feeling, this, it's almost like a warm embrace, like a hug from your grandma, is the way it's been explained to me. And they said, once you feel that, you, you crave it constantly. I've seen it all the way from business executive type people to homeless people. I mean, there, there's, no, there's no limits to it. And, you know, it's, it's sad when you look in the eyes of a 26-year-old and they feel like they have nothing left. They feel like it doesn't matter, that nobody cares if they live or die. Listen to that. Nobody cares if they live or die. That's how addiction grips the mind. Not that long ago, it used to be that overdose calls were few and far between. Now, they're routine for first responders. And if you ask about them, they'll have a story for you. Or two, or three. It's not stopping. A woman who overdosed in a gas station parking lot with all of her children in the car, and she had four, and they were all crying hysterically, and it broke my heart. Every truck on this shift, it was like overdose after overdose after overdose. It was a bad batch of heroin that hit the streets in High Point, sold to whoever, to whoever, to whoever, ended up in Forsyth County. Um, and we were like, my gosh, not another one. Oh, what is going on here? I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't get our hand, a handle on it. A 27-year-old male possibly unconscious after an overdose on heroin and possibly fentanyl as well. It's four PDs on the bus. We don't invite ourselves to these calls. We are there because we've been dispatched to these calls. So we come in with the patient's best interest in mind or the family member and you know, whatever the situation is, we're there to help mitigate that situation. I can't take you with me inside that house where the overdose is happening, but I can walk you through what I'm seeing. We first go inside, I go upstairs, there's police and firefighters already there. I look down and I see a woman carrying two kids. So there are kids in the house. We learned that the guy who overdosed, his girlfriend actually gave him Narcan because she gave it to him so quickly. That's probably the reason he's alive right now. But he's refusing to go to the hospital. He's refusing that treatment. The victim told the paramedics that he had just taken some Tylenol. That's why his eyes looked the way they did. But the paramedics know better. They know that he used some drug. And then an officer actually found a syringe and then another bag with white powder in it. That's when people start freaking out. No one wants to get in trouble for any of this, but this guy really needs help. And again, he's refusing treatment. The paramedics want to give him more Narcan, but he doesn't want that either. We leave the house with the victim alive for now, but they're worried that the drugs he took earlier might kick back in and really wish that he had taken that extra dose of Narcan. I mean, typically, if they're not going to go to the hospital, they don't get that charged up. You know, it's, it's usually, no, I don't want to go, and, you know, they'll take me by car or whatever. Um, but that was extreme. Yeah, bystanders really ratcheted that up. Yeah, bystanders complicate things a yeah, lot. they certainly did. But I guess there's nothing else you can do. Like, there's... No. We did everything we could. We had PD on scene. We had family try to convince him. We called the medical director um, to talk with them and let them know of the situation. I mean, we can't kidnap anyone. If he's oriented, he can refuse, unfortunately.
So what typically goes through my mind is this person, if I don't do what I'm trained to do, this person probably will die. And when you're in, at that moment in time, you're gonna give, you're gonna follow your protocols and you're gonna give the medication, but also on a personal level, it's as you're pushing that medication, you're thinking, I'm, this is gonna save this person's life. This isn't like in a movie where someone just snaps out of it. Depending on the person, it could take about five to 10 minutes to wake up. And when they do, it's probably not gonna be pretty. Think about it, they were just jolted from a high, and also death. They'll probably feel sick, angry, confused. The experience that you saw is not necessarily the same for everyone. Some people require CPR, some people never revive. So it just depends on how much they've taken and what it's cut with. Or you have a patient look up at you and say, how bad was I this time? And you say, well, you're breathing about six times a minute. You were grayish blue color. You were just about to die. And they go, oh. And then you say, have you done this before? Oh yeah, I've been Narcan before, but I've never been this bad. This call is for an older woman. She says she has chest pains, but then goes on to say she hurts all over. They try and give her baby aspirin to help, but she won't swallow them. She says she hasn't eaten all day. Her pain now, she says, is 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. It turns out she was so dehydrated that they actually couldn't put an IV in her, so we had to rush over here, and she's getting the help right now. And just like our first guy, when you look at her pupils, her pupils were a two millimeter, so that means they're pinpoint. Your pupils aren't pinpoint, mine aren't pinpoint, so hers are pinpoint for a reason, because of the pain meds that she was given at the nursing facility. So you don't have to be completely zonked out no, with the overdose. Uh, you just have to be Right, it hadn't it hadn't affected her respiratory yet. And but just her general appearance, her sluggishness, um, repeating the same thing, saying she hurt all over, her pain level she was saying and what she was presenting with didn't match. But the pinpoint pupils is pretty much I mean you can't fake that. It affects us. You know, I firmly believe that the human brain is not designed to see, hear, smell, or taste the things that we have to deal with. Um, you definitely see the other side of society that you don't see, like, anywhere else. whatever's that to me I, I that doesn't really get to me it's the after the fact and then you sit back and you go wow I just did this 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 and this and I just saw this 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 and this and whew. but then you don't know the ending You have to deal with those kinds. If you don't, it's gonna it's gonna bother you as time goes on. The frequency of seeing people doing things to themselves, doing things to each other, the violent stuff we get to see does have an effect on fire, police, and EMS. You gotta have some sort of outside activity other than EMS to de-stress yourself. Um, What's that for you? I enjoy hunting and fishing, spending time with my family. I would say my brother is probably my biggest release. He used to be a fire chief up in New York. You can kind of lose touch with quote unquote normal, whatever that may mean. Um, and you just have to find coping mechanisms to get through it. So I'll go home and I've had a bad shift and 
you know, my kids are at school, my wife's gone to work, and I can't talk to them about this stuff anyway, but the one person I can talk to who is not gonna judge me and is guaranteed not to tell anybody anything is my horse. Standing there and just taking a breath of my horse's neck, and it's like when I exhale, it just, and it all just kind of flows away. So I just finished the 12 hour shift and it's honestly a lot to completely digest because they run on so many different calls and I have such a new perspective on what paramedics do. They have to know exactly what to do at exactly the right time. You're thinking a mile a minute, but you have to be precise because people's lives depend on talking to people to making them feel comfortable once they were in their care. So again, a whole new appreciation for what paramedics do and just the way they respond and have to kind of compress everything in and take multiple calls a night and just know how to react to multiple different types of calls at any given moment.